Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I'm always a little bit intimidated when you see these uh, super polymath chess players come out who can uh, plot courses and make things move in new ways. It was very, very impressive. So let me just put some things into uh, context for uh, all of you. So 12 years ago, ASU and GSV came together, and we came together to be a part of trying to find a way to bring together everybody that was moving educational technology forward, learning technology forward. Uh, both GSV and ASU were very interested in how do we accelerate the transformation of learning and the transformation of social outcomes and the transformation of, of all the great things that educational attainment helps to produce. And in our case at ASU, what we were deeply interested in, and what I want to give you today as a status report on this, what we were deeply interested in was how could we link up with the hot plasma gas of innovation and entrepreneurship that's so powerful in this country and find a way to link that with what we were trying to do, which at the time, 12 years ago, we were in our uh, earlier stages of evolving a new kind of public university. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, where we are in that context. Can we go to the first slide? Yeah, there we go. So, so it's not that we're involved in the, uh, you know, that we're transforming higher education at ASU. I want to make clear everybody understands this. We're one of the agents, one of the groups, one of the institutions, one of the clusters of people that are of the view that it has to be transformed. And transform does not mean annihilating the past, just to be clear. It doesn't mean throwing everything that we've done over the last several thousand years to uh, improve and enhance the way that people learn. Far from it, it means to work towards the creation of the future that we want. Uh, I just uh, reread for the second time while hiking around uh, Arizona and Maine this summer the biography of Ben Franklin by Walter Isaacson, and there's this phrase in here, by failing to prepare, you prepare to fail. We got lots of examples of that in our broader society right now. By failing to prepare, you prepare to fail. And so it is the case that transformation is a function not only of institutional change, it's a function also of sort of cycles. And so I just happened to pick 80-year uh, cycles just to let you know that, that three cycles ago was the American Revolution. Three cycles ago. The Civil War, American Revolution roughly 1780, Civil War roughly 1860, World War II, roughly 1940, and then today, these 80-year cycles. So just in your mind, think about the transformations in everything in these 80-year cycles. 80 years is a couple, you know, three generations, three-plus generations, depending on, on uh, age rates and so forth, birth rates and so forth. But nonetheless, changes of unbelievable scale in 80-year time frame. So the question then is, as we're hurtling towards 2100, everyone in this room knows that the rate of change is accelerating, the complexity is accelerating. The demand for learning is accelerating. The need for social transformation and, and uh, social evolution is, is accelerating. The need for educational attainment enhancement is accelerating. So where is all that going? So how do we, particularly with the starkness of the moment of the pandemic, how do we find a way to seize this moment where our attention has been gathered? American Revolution, the Civil War, World War II, the great pandemic, which, by the way, our scientists and myself believe that we're basically in the top of the third inning, so don't think that we're in the, in the bottom of the ninth. We're not in this pandemic, and so we're, we're learning to adjust and learning to adapt, and we're learning to adjust and adapt in real time at our institution as are many other institutions that are out there. But how do we seize this moment to drive significant and enduring human progress while we realize the complexities around us? We have a population which is probably at 30% the level of science literacy necessary to actually deal with the biological complexities of the interrelationship of the organisms that we live with on the planet. And we've got global climate change. You can believe that it's coming or not coming. It makes no difference. Change is coming. And change is coming at a higher rate of acceleration than we've ever had before. And so this notion of also how do we, in our case at ASU, how do we reconstruct the notion of the public university to be a force for radical democratization of higher education? And radical democratization means no more will it only be a thing for the few. No more will it only be a thing where uh, you're the best student, you get to go to college, only a few of you get to college, only a few of you who can afford to go to college can go to college. How do we democratize and radically alter higher education itself? So turns out if you look at time, this is just a little continuum for you to take a look at. Uh, there used to be guilds and academies. They were fantastic, filled with brilliant, unbelievable people, the entire renaissance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 the Greek academicians from uh, uh, over 2,000 years ago on this chart, but they didn't educate anybody. They produced great ideas. 
We began building colleges and universities a few hundred years ago. Small. They didn't educate anybody. Now what we can see just in the last few decades is a massive, massive change, massive, massive change going forward in terms of numbers, but old systems, old systems of engagement, highly selective systems of, of selection, uh, and so forth and so on. So what we're looking to do is to help facilitate uh, through partnerships, through alignments, through this meeting, learning enterprise designs in which democratization of higher education can be enhanced. And top left, it will not mean the abandonment of the faculty. Lots and lots of people are trying to find ways to have robots replace the faculty, to have machines replace the faculty. I mean, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It's about faculty becoming the central asset of the university in all universities, wherever they come from. And I won't walk through this entire list of things, but that top right, the concept of traditional student. So our colleges and universities with the massive amounts of resources and endowments and government support and uh, public support and public trust that they've been given, are they really just for 18 to 25 year olds? Are they really going to seed the rest of the learning environment and the rest of the learning need and the rest of the learning outcomes to others? We need to change the concept of traditional students. Now, this is our charter. This is a derived charter. I ask you to just take a close look at it. We're a comprehensive public research university, meaning we, are, we serve the public. Research is our methodological, think of it as our pedagogical design. A university is our organizational cultural structure. But we decided to measure ourselves by a different thing. We will measure ourselves by who we include versus who we exclude and how our students succeed. The success of the student is the measure of the outcome of the public university and the charter that we've put together. We'll do research and advance everything that we possibly can. You know, we have thousands of research groups at ASU, tens of thousands of people involved in research at ASU. We've got objects on every planetary investigation mission that's undergoing uh, uh, out in space right now that's in, in our solar system, from the US anyway. Uh, and, uh, and so, but we're trying to work towards public value. And the last thing is that the fundamental measure of our success is, are we serving our community? Are we enhancing economic, social, and cultural overall health and well-being of our community? Now, we've decided also to move forward, and this meeting has been a really big, big important thing of this. There are no national laboratories in education. There are no, you know, Argonne National Laboratories, Brookhaven National Laboratories, Los Alamos National Laboratories in education. For whatever reason, we decided that that stuff was more important than educational technology and development. So we're emerging as a national service university in partnership, in alignment. Hundreds of interactive uh, relationships with technology developers and educational and learning technology uh, uh, development organizations, public and private. And so what we're working towards then is how does one build something that's missing in the present educational ecosystem? We're a prototype of a new type of university, a new type of university focused on national service, but at a very large scale with very large development capability inside of it. Now, just in this last semester during the pandemic, and we've been fully operational during the pandemic, uh, uh, largest number of graduates that we've ever had, uh, every technological mitigation that you can possibly imagine, invented our own uh, high-speed robot-driven saliva-based PCR test, et cetera, et cetera. But we've restructured the university around this fundamental idea. At the heart of the institution is that maroon core, what we call the, the faculty, the staff, the researchers, the knowledge entrepreneurs. They're in the knowledge core. They're around the knowledge core. The maroon is the knowledge core. That is everything that we know as a species, everything that we can discern from every culture, every background, every theory, every idea, every lesson, everything that's ever gone on in terms of knowledge. We have a group of people called our faculty, our staff, who are surrounding that core of knowledge. They add to that core of knowledge. They contribute to it. They learn from it. They blow it up. They produce new theories, new models, new assumptions. And that's the pulsing nuclear core of our institution. Now, our institution now is built around three functional enterprises. At the top is the academic enterprise, which is what you would think of as the traditional university. Academic programs, degree programs, departments, schools. We have. 150 academic departments or schools. We have 20 uh, colleges. They're structured. They have hundreds of degrees that we're offering. We have 75,000 students on campus showing up next week. We have over 80,000 students pursuing degrees uh, uh, online uh, uh, with us. And we have hundreds of thousands of other people that are connected to us through the academic enterprise. But that's insufficient. So on the bottom left, we've also constructed the university to operate from that same faculty, that same staff, 
that same core of knowledge, what we call the knowledge enterprise, and the knowledge enterprise is really focused on this notion of how can we contribute in scaled ways to things that are the most important things that you can possibly imagine. So our global futures laboratory that we're building within our knowledge enterprise is a prototype for a medical center for the planet. Uh, I won't walk you through all of that, but I want you to know that from this core, this pulsing core, this pulsing core of knowledge and the faculty, which many people in the private sector write off, write them off as unnecessary. That's a fool's errand. A fool's errand. And then lastly, and new for us on the orange on the side, is that we're restructuring the institution to also take that same energy, that same faculty, that same drive, as well as other partnerships that we can build and create learning assets and learning modules for any learner anywhere at any point in their life in any social configuration that you can imagine. Because we have made the assets that we've been building available to too few people and they can be made available to a broader group of people. So we're now structured in this way. Now, I don't want to belabor this slide. I've showed this slide in the past. In fact, this has been the way in which we have evolved, including being a part of the ASU GSV con conclave here, you know, every year for 12 years. The core again in the middle. The gold at the bottom is the university ourself. And then the arcs at the top are all the ways that we're now teaching and learning. And there's a new shade of gray, the darker gray, which is campus digital sync what we call ASU Sync, so post-pandemic. In fact, this fall semester, we're launching eight or 10 degrees and master's degrees levels where the students can come in from anywhere synchronously, be a part of our student body and earn their degree, but they're not on campus with us. And I'm gonna spend some time talking today about education through exploration, which is the fourth ring out. So we have at the, the light gray on campus, full immersion, the dark gray, ASU Sync, the light blue is uh, digital immersion, the darker blue is MOOC and massively open, and then orange is this way, something we've been struggling with for years. How do we enable massive educational attainment using exploration and the idea of human excitement through exploration? So I'll come back to that. So again, the knowledge core, which we've talked about. But now if you take this slide, this core in the middle, and then you look at our faculty, this is an actual map of the faculty of Arizona State University, thousands of individuals, the si thousands of individuals, these are all of their relationships. So the colors and the codes and the scale and the connections shows how many other people they're connected to, how many other faculty they're connected to, how they're working. And so what I'm trying to impart on all of you is that most of us, most of you outside of academia have, in general, disdainful things to think about faculty. Disdainful things like that you can't control them, you can't do this. Control is not even a word. It doesn't even exist. What you have to create is an environment to contain and empower the nuclear reaction occurring between and among these individuals. And so what we've tried to do at ASU is to expand the number of connections. And so this actual chart I'll show you here. So anyway, so, so let me just say that our design, full immersion, digital immersion, digital immersion, massively open, education through exploration, all these things are these companies that we've listed here and technologies that we've listed here are projects or programs that we've derived from our partnership with others in terms of making things move forward. So our design enables these things. But I want to talk a little bit about faculty and some of the faculty on this slide are, are in the room. So we have fantastic faculty. Thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals are a part of our faculty. They're organized into an ever dynamic and changing intellectual environment. So I just want to say to those of you that are out there in the private sector, building technologies, advancing technologies, advancing tools and so forth and so on. We need, faculty, we need tools and devices and technologies that empower our faculty. Let's take a look at a couple of them. So this is Kenro Kasumi, who's a professor in our School of Life Sciences, who was the director of that school and is now the dean of uh, uh, natural sciences at ASU. This is his map. This is his map. This is the people that he's connected to just at ASU, much less the people that he's connected to somewhere else. So again, I ask you when you think about a faculty member, think about a faculty member as a part of a of a, of, a, of a nuclear reaction, if you will, and a, a way in which forces and dynamic energy comes together. So, so Kenro has been intimately involved in the expansion of astronomy at ASU. So there's a lot on this slide, but understand that on campus we have 73 faculty members, not in astronomy, but in our School of Earth and Space Exploration, in which there's astronomers there. They do a lot of research looking at the bottom right. I'm just trying to show you that that same program, astronomy, that degree is massively focused in research at ASU. There are more astronomy majors in our School of Earth and Space Exploration as well as the number of exploration-oriented degrees than we've ever had. We also have an online degree in astronomy that's tied back to the same faculty. So the point is that when, when, when we talk about what we're doing, we're talking about our faculty, our students, our engagement, our design. 
we're, we're, we, don't, we don't bring in people who are not really faculty, call them faculty, and then have them you know, do these things. Our faculty are what are behind this. And so, so uh, uh, this, for instance, is uh, our STEM online degrees. We have 20,000 online STEM majors. All these degrees that we have here are driven by our faculty. Here's a faculty member, Ann Jones. In fact, I think she's at, at the meeting. I thought I saw her. This is, this is uh, she's a, a faculty member in molecular sciences, which is a complex notion of understanding the, the, the matter that makes up uh, the universe. And uh, uh, this is Ann's network. And Ann has been involved in a number of different things. And so I'm trying to give you a sense of the faculty themselves. And I'm not going to show you this video, but uh, she was a part of a group of faculty members that built the first online biochemistry degree. We got some snarky letter from some dean of admissions at some medical school you know, some uppity medical school somewhere that decided to say that we're not going to hire any of your kids or bring any of your kids into the medical school from your online programs because they don't have any experience in groups. Uh, they didn't live through the undergraduate experience. They must be just robotically trained. And so, you know, first, you're an idiot. Second, <laughs> you're an ignorant idiot. Third, our professors stand behind the product, the degree, biochemistry, Arizona State University. It's our faculty. It's our core. It's our activity. So I won't show you that video, but it's, it's, it's pretty snarky. And then Mike Angeletta, another one of our faculty members, he is the master genius on the pedagogical side of designing our first full immersion avatar-driven virtual reality learning experiences that you can experience downstairs here if you sign up. So that's not just, and I'll show you the video here in a second, that's not just Hollywood talking about what Hollywood can do and all the geniuses from Hollywood and all the dynamic things that they can do that we could never do, but that's matched up with Mike. So Mike is a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a master teacher at ASU, carries the status and rank of president's professor. He is the intellectual architect of taking us into this next realm of learning at a scale. And so I'm trying to show you what it means to be plugged into the nuclear reactor, also known as a university faculty. So I'll just show you this video. Let's run this video. So this morning I was uh, in an interview on uh, Financial Net one of the financial networks, and uh, the interviewer asked me, um, Akiko, she asked me, she said, well, is this all about the pandemic? Is this, is this just another way to move online learning into a higher level quality of activity? I said, we did all of this with our partner, Dreamscape Immersive, during the pandemic and built this and advanced this, and it's accelerating at a very rapid rate. But here's why we're doing this. Here's why we're doing this. More than half the people that start STEM education in the United States at an American college or university don't even stay in it. More than half, twice as many people want to be trained in science and other things, and engineering and other things, than are able to attain that. And our educational system, except for the most elite and gifted high school students and naturally three-dimensionally thinking individuals who can capture and understand organic chemistry or complex evolutionary biology or what have you, their, their, their process of going through this is it's so difficult that it's just an annihilation. So what we're interested in, this is a technology platform, a learning platform, a new way of moving things forward that we think can change a lot of subjects, not just science, but what we call activating a whole new way of learning, that is adding back the notion of emotional engagement to learning through the act of exploration by turning the learner into the exploring scientist in an environment where everyone is even. You never, you know, it doesn't make any difference if your parents were so rich that you got to go to Zimbabwe on a, uh, a safari when you were in high school and, and the other kid has, you know, made it over to the zoo once or twice in their life because everybody enters these environments equal. Everyone enters these environments as a unique individual learning scientist working with others, working with others along the way. If you haven't had a chance to experience, you can experience it down, downstairs, but this will have an on-campus manifestation beginning in the spring semester of 2022, moving to online manifestations uh, uh, after that, and biology is only where we're starting, and I don't have time to walk you all the way through this, but this is a lot more than responding to the quote-unquote pandemic. This is us attempting to modify the way that we teach, the way that we learn. We've got another faculty member here, Robert, who's in our School for Art, Media, and Engineering, a completely new intellectual construct. These are all of his connections. Well, this, this summer, 150 of his, this goes to the nature of what a university does at its core as it moves forward. 150 students working with him, taking the technology that you just saw, 
and then working on these projects that you see on the right, Dreamscape Mars, Creativity Commons, all these other kinds of things that are going on. 150 unique students now as creators, as a part of this pulsing knowledge enterprise. Anne McKenna, who is a faculty member in engineering, who's our vice dean for engineering, she's connected in these ways. So she's advancing new degree programs, new online degree programs, new activities, uh, new programs in London, this program that we started in London. So the point is, through these mechanisms, nine years ago, 10 years ago, we had 6,000 on-campus engineering students with a relatively low retention rate of only 68%, a relatively male-dominated white and Asian student body 10 years ago. Not anymore, we have 25,000 engineering students this semester. 18,000 on campus, 7,000 online, and we're more diverse than we used to be the entire size of the school. Completely transformed institution because of these kinds of faculty members being able to move things forward. And then we have projects like this. I know it's hard to see. We're also driven by, you know, where is science fiction taking us? So a science fiction book 25 years ago, The Diamond Age, thought up the notion of a universal learning platform called the Young Ladies Primer. This is the digestion of what it would take to do that as articulated in the science fiction novel. Well, we're trying to build one of these. We need help in building one of these. We need a tool that you can hand to any kid anywhere that enhancing their, enhances their learning outcomes as an individual. So looking to the future, we're also working with all the companies that you see here in each of our realms of learning. We've got companies, these are companies embedded at ASU, a relationship with ASU, their technologies are being uh, advanced at ASU. Uh, you can see education through exploration. We have Dreamscape Learn, Dreamscape Immersive is our partner there as we've already talked about. And then just to sort of come to where we are, every year at this meeting for the last several years, I've put up the list of what we wish we had. So just look at the orange at the bottom, Realm 4, Education Through Exploration, Virtual Augmented Reality for Learning. Yeah, we had a little of this, a little of that. We had things going on at the university, but not until we met another sector, another set of geniuses, another set of unbelievably capable people coming out of Hollywood, Dreamscape Immersive, the kind of creativity and technological capabilities that they have, they couldn't move into the learning space, we couldn't move into their space, but together we can move in ways that neither of us could ever have imagined. So that's one of these lines on here. Just go up to uh, the gold on the right, mastery of science for all. Math and science, mastery for all. We're not trying to turn people into mathematicians. We're not trying to turn everyone into science, but I ask you to actually ask yourself, what increased science literacy would mean for our society when dealing with things like, I don't know, a great pandemic, when dealing with things like uh, changes that will be accelerated through technological uh, drivers or global climate change or what have you. So we're trying to take math and science off the table as a constraint. Well, that's under capacities that we're trying to develop. What do you got? <laughs> what tools do you have? Uh, what do you got that's going on? So we're, we're meeting with a lot of people that are here. We're meeting with a lot of things that are happening. And so let me just sort of put this into, um, let me have you keep looking at the list there just for a second. Uh, look under digital immersion on the bottom left. Technology to support relationships and build organizational affinity. What we mean is really group affinity. Personalization, personalization is fantastic, but complete isolation of individual learners doesn't work. We need group learning, group engagement group empowerment, group creativity, faculty members being able to operate in multiple spaces in multiple ways. And so, so let me just sort of conclude with the fact that, you know, we're very excited about all things that the ASU GSV meeting is bringing together, the kinds of things that we can move forward with, the kinds of things that are happening. And, 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 and let me just put into perspective that what we're really trying to do is, before your very eyes, do something that's extremely difficult, which is birth a new kind of public university. Create a new kind of public university. Empower that university with every tool that humans can develop and find a way in which that university can now engage in its true public mission which is the success, ultimately, of the democracy. The success of the democracy. And all of the individuals who were involved in the intellectual aspects of the design of this country knew that education, at the end of the day, would be fundamental to its success. They never could have imagined that we would be a country of 335 million people or that other democracies would be emerging around the planet in significant ways, or that the planet and our, and our species would become in conflict with each other. They never could have imagined any of these things. And so what I can tell you is that if any of you think that what we've done up to this point is going to be adequate to secure the kinds of 
outcomes and blessings of the, of the, that we've experienced in the past, unequivocally, we're not ready. Look around. We're not ready. We're not ready. Not that things aren't great, are good. They're just not ready for what lies ahead. And so I just want to say, uh, if we can go to the last side, thank you to all of you that have been a part of this meeting, a part of, uh, of, of developing this spirit of energized creativity in the learning technology and educational technology space. And I just ask all of you to help those of us that are trying to emerge as new kinds of colleges and universities to help us to be more successful. Thank you. Thank you so much to ASU President Michael Crow. Give it up for him.